Hey, yo, what is a cypher? Spending my creative energy on, you know, dehumanizing another person. You. The knowledge of the cypher is to enlighten you. Where you think the cypher come from? The gods. Because you try to jump the cypher and it goes this way. <laughs> Welcome to The Cypher, a weekly podcast bringing you talks with the most interesting figures in hip-hop and culture. I'm your host, Sean Sotero. This is episode 149, a talk with Cambada. Cambada was born in New Haven, Connecticut in 1987, the middle of the crack era. He left for Florida at 18 and released several successful mixtapes, The Visionary and The Visionary 2, shortly afterwards. They showed off his incredible writing skills and already top-notch wordplay. But it wouldn't be until 2013 that Cambada would really come into his own. He changed his way of thinking, with some chemical help, and created the powerful and trippy Smoke and Mirrors series, a three mixtape collection that was released between 2013 and 2015. The trilogy took on mystical themes and melded them with reflections on childhood to create a voice that didn't sound like anything else. Cambada's latest release is Smoke and Mirrors DMT, Definitive Metagod Trilogy, a collection of some of the best songs of the series, plus previously unreleased material. We caught up with Cambada at Crosstown Studios in Harlem. When Cambada came by, he left us a few items to give away to our listeners. There's a t-shirt and a business card that doubles as a USB drive that contains his new album, DMT. While you're listening to this episode, Answer the following three questions. Email your responses to contest at thecyphershow.com. We'll randomly pick one winner from all the correct entries. The questions are, number one, which Connecticut city is Cambada from? Number two, which Cambada song uses the letters in the title to inspire the song's lyrics? Number three, which brand new Cambada song rhymes every line of the first verse with the song's title? Remember, email your answers to contest at thecyphershow.com to enter. The best way to make sure you hear each episode of The Cypher as soon as it drops is to subscribe on iTunes. Once you do that, you should check out our back catalog. If you enjoy this show, for example... Listen to our interview with Cambada's longtime friend and mentor, Nino Bless, on episode 82. But the best way to help the show is to become a patron. Visit us at patreon.com slash the cypher show and sign up. If even a fraction of our listeners contributed a dollar a month, it would go a long way towards making the show sustainable. If you're curious about any of the songs we're playing during this episode, visit thecyphershow.com to find a complete list. While you're there, sign up for our monthly newsletter to stay on top of what we're up to on the air and in the wider world. And now, here's the rapper that drugs make talk, Cambada. Uh, so you got you got your ready your energy drink ready to go. Yeah, I need it, man. I, I stay up real late writing, man. I'm a guy. I like to catch that 3 a.m., 4 a.m. Uh, highway, man. That minefield. Yeah, what's what's a, what's it. what's good about that that time? Most people are sleeping, man. So it's like I look at thought and shit like that. Have you ever seen Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory? Mm -hmm. Remember when uh, Mikey TV got zapped in the microwave, and he said, "I'm up here. He's up there, a billion pieces." <laughs> it's like that. It's like when you when you when you're in that creative mode. It's like you can. I find more obscure creations in the minefield if you're up at these. These are like the magic hours. Mm -hmm. If you study magic, you know, you you see that it's always around these hours that you get the best creations sometimes. So I'm always up. I'm always the last one to sleep in every, every situation that I'm in. Interesting. You know? And, you know, one of the... A lot, of, especially recent music, mm -hmm. there's kind of almost like a ritual feel to it. I feel like you're kind of interested in like shamanism and ritual yeah. and stuff, and kind of bringing that into hip hop. How do you do that? Um, 
my life was, has been uh, surrounded by drugs my whole life. Um, as a child, uh, you know, living in a household, it was all street drugs. Um, so growing up, I kind of stayed away from it. But all through my life, I always was kind of a, an obscure observer, you know, um, kind of on the outside. If you could picture reality as a high school cafeteria, you know, I had the qualities to be at the po popular table and I would sit there. But as soon as I notice uh, everyone's in their mode, I would then take a step back. And then once people feel that zone, I take a step back. I'm always trying to be outside the circle and observe everything. There's always that moment of clarity I have where I'm like, holy shit, what's going on? You know, so that's always been there. But it wasn't until I was uh, 23 that I started uh, experimenting with uh, marijuana. That was roughly about five or six years ago. Um, and then that led to uh, not that it's a gateway drug, maybe a gateway to heaven. But uh, it was like from there... Once I've realized its psychedelic impact and uh, it, its effect on in, my intellect and my ability to sit down and, you know, want to write, I just started dealing with other psychedelics. So, you know, one thing led to another. It was kind of real fast when my friends were into it. So it was like I was able to go from weed to shrooms to DMT to acid and Ever since then, it's been it's been a root it's been a ritual, like you said. I mean, I started getting into health, starting in a you know, sun sun gazing, you know, taking long walks, drinking water, you know, just kind of getting getting right and trying to advance myself cognitively, it, but with intention to do so. So that ritualistic aspect of it is real. I've created my own religion. It's kind of difficult in New York because I was living in Florida in a beach town with mm -hmm. trails and shit. So it was like really easy to get in that zone out here. Out here, it's it's a lot different. The 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 way is the frequency is so different. What do you mean by created your own religion? Um, religion, in the sense of repetitious acts that lead to some kind of effect on my experience, whether it be mental or physical. So everyone has a routine, maybe a better word or a regimen. And it's uh, to me, they're all those words are one and the same in a sense, you know, because everyone's having a spiritual strange experience here. So anything you do, so waking up, getting a cup of coffee, smoking a blunt, you know, meditating, using binaural beats, go outside, maybe sit under the sun, eyes open for like 10 minutes, get that energy, you know, create from there. And then later on you create at night and, you know, it, it's different things I'll do to kind of um, allow myself to slip in that zone. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all, it's basically all mental and placebo effect. I think everything, I think the deeper the ritual and the regimen, the deeper you convince yourself. That's where magic comes from and all the like. So if I was trying to put a spell on someone and I had like chicken bones and blood and a mirror and candles and I have this mantra, all these steps lead to deeper and deeper impact on the self and the environment around you. So it's like different ways to conjure the belief in yourself as well, mm -hmm. you know. Now, you said a minute ago that in the early part of your life, you stayed away from drugs because of what you saw around. Mm -hmm. And in one of your songs, you kind of hint that it had something to do with your father and his relationship with drugs. I used to not smoke because my father did. I wasn't really fucking with the drug thing. But now I'm stressed out and I'm older. Got the weight of the world up on my shoulder. Yeah, my mom, my dad, uh, really everyone around me except my grandma. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Everyone, my all the all the all the male figures, my uncle, my mom, all their boyfriends, they all and it, it's these are all amazingly intelligent, talented people. Literally, like that's where I I might have a small amount of what they had. You know what I mean? But it's like that wave they had no information you know it was like you it was like marijuana or something you know crack cocaine sweep through the inner city uh neighborhoods like an epidemic and at first it was cool and then after a while it gets really addictive and things start falling apart around you 
and all the things you built up in your life are gone in an instant. So seeing those kind of things, experiencing those kind of things kind of took me away from it. But yeah, with my father specifically, uh, he left when I was like four, you know what I mean? Uh, drugs, women, et cetera. He was also an orphan himself. So there was probably a lot more deeply rooted reasons and avoidance issues that go along with that as well. Mm -hmm. You grew up till you were 18 in New Haven. Yeah. Right? Um, and like, uh, you were born in 87, which, like you were saying, is kind of right at the time that the crack epidemic was kind of starting to make national headlines and starting to oh, yeah, become was, yeah, more yeah. widely known. And Definitely. You, know, you reference that, obviously, on your your Crack Baby series of, of mixtapes, mm -hmm. you know, kind of alluding to your own life. What was growing up in, in New Haven like? Um, honestly, I had, I was, I had a good childhood, you know what I mean? Besides the drugs, mm -hmm. uh, I had my grandma there that who was, who was really strong. So she kept me in, she kept me in church. She kept me in any program that I wanted. So, you know, karate, track and field, basketball. I also did acting when I was a child. So her, her thing was using whatever money she had to keep me as busy and, and, giving me those experiences as possible is kind of what molded my intellect as, as a person now, you know, so I was always in the gifted classes, able to go here, go there, the science fairs. Um, I, I was, I was really all over the place. You know what I mean? It wasn't until high school that, uh, you know, I got into rapping, you know, that's when that happened. But that's once you become conscious of yourself, that's when you start making those retrospective realizations and you have to kind of outlet yourself creatively. Sometimes the more traumatic it is, the earlier it hits you. But, um, you know, I, I used to suppress everything through my activities and staying busy, you know. Mm -hmm. And when you started rapping, that was, I guess, you know, early high school. And you picked up your rap name, I think, around when you were 15, right? Where did it come from? I started, I would say, Cambada was me taking rap seriously around 15. Uh, prior to that, um, there was always in my house growing up, soul music, Motown, Michael Jackson, whatever. I was always into soul music, melody, harmony, singing, stuff like that. My uncle was into hip hop, but old school hip hop, Big Daddy Kane, uh, he was a hip hop dancer, a pop locker, break dancer. And he, I used to see his videos all the time. And what stood out was Planet Rock by uh, Africa Bambata was one of the group, groups that he used to pop lock to. Bambata was always just the dopest name to me. Um, but when I was 15, growing up with a name Cam, everyone called me Killer Cam as a rapper, but obviously that name was taken. Right. So when I was about 15, I was writing a freestyle and it dawned on me. I was, it was uh, Santana's Town by Joel Santana. And he's like, I'm old school like Bam Bada, no man's hotter. The damn Dada, I jam proper, you man's not a That moment, it hit me. I was like, Cam Bada, like, boom. Like, I always like to take names and, like, kind of screw them up. Like, you know, like, if there's Joe Montana and if you're trying to describe weed, you might say Dro Montana. Right. Something or like Marcus Garvey, you might have Marcus Barvey. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've been playing on words like that since I was a kid. So Cambada was just natural. But that was when I really started taking it seriously. And I had a rap group around that time in high school. And it was it was crazy. What was the group name? Gang Green. Gang Green. But it was also like, you know, Gang Green is the sickness when you have an open wound. And then right. we gain green. And we're, you know, it's, it was like, it was, there was four or five of us. Um, and we were, we thought we were the hottest shit. We all had bars, syllabics. It was, this is the time of Cassidy, J.R. Ryder, Dipset. So, mm -hmm. you know. Nice. When you hit 18, though, you didn't end up going to school. You ended up going to, down to Tampa. Well, yeah, it was, it was school. I, I instead school of, initially. yeah, what ended up happening, man, it was like, yo, I was, I was a great student in high school academically up until my senior year. Things started kind of, you know, I stopped giving a fuck. I started realizing what school was. And, um, I got a couple F's and they didn't let me graduate. I'm like, how could you just let me not 
have anything because of two. Like, you guys should, like, figure something out because prior to this, I've only gotten A's and B's, and you're going to let a couple F's, like, not let me get a f- diploma? This seems kind of ridiculous. So I kind of lost faith in that. I went to a tech school in Tampa called uh, IADT where I was studying sound engineering. It was kind of like a built-in excuse to do music and get the fuck out of Connecticut at the same time. Mm. So I was like, yo, gone. I, I convinced my grandma to sign off on a ridiculous loan. And um, I went out there. School only lot. I met some really valuable friends. And we. I had some very valuable uh, experiences, but school only lasted for me about six months. Other than that, I was just partying and, you know, doing music, not as seriously as I liked it to, but we were doing music the whole time. And, um, it started getting real crazy once we started getting into it, you know, shout out Eddie Deuce, you know, that is, that was actually my road dog since those times. Oh, nice. And what, what was the rap scene like in Tampa when you got there? Oh, uh, it was, it was very Southern. It was very Southern at the time. Like it was like, get low, get low, get loose, get low, get low. Like it was, it was a whole different kind of movement, man. Very polar opposite to what I was doing. I came in hard, man. This is like, I'm, I was a spitter, like, ugh, you know what I mean? It was all bars for me and to come into that where it's all melody and bounce. It was completely different scene, but I started really getting into it probably around like 2008, 2009. I started getting into the Tampa scene, started getting a little bit more hip hop. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that's when I started really blending in out there, you know, making a name for myself and shit. You were doing some battle stuff around that period or was that a little later um i used to battle all through high school uh there was a time when uh we took a trip to miami and um grind time was happening at this and they were having like a grind time rap battle but this yeah, is... i think that maybe i saw some video from around then i think yeah yeah how do you know that you can win this competition i'm, I'm the best at what i do i don't compare myself to anybody that's going to be on the stage tonight they're not my competition it was all freestyle back then. You don't know who you're battling, and it was a beat. You know what I mean? So it was like, but I made it to the final round. The only reason I lost is because the guy who was on the stage brought his whole peop- his whole clique with him, man. But I bodied everyone. It was, it was, and that's not even what I do, you know, at that time. Like, I wasn't freestyling at all, but it was just the energy, and I, I had, you know... It was that young ignorance, you know, and I just went up there and bodied everyone. But that that was kind of the end of my battle, and I don't really like spending my creative energy on, you know, dehumanizing another person, you know. But if I have to, if I have to take it there, it will happen. I'd rather it happen musically, though, so at least it's t- it's, it's encapsulated in time. Yeah, and uh, right, I mean, this was maybe even before The Visionary came out or, or maybe somewhere in between. You work with the guy who's maybe my favorite mixtape DJ, Green Lantern. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, wow, you went real far back. I can either bring life to the music and death to the DJ Green Lantern. People who are legend. Views, this is an invasion. Did I shock the world? DJ yeah, at the time, man, I was working with a, a DJ Nice. And he had connections to illroots.com, two dope boys.com, notright.com, all the, all the rap blogs, shit like that. Real early, like 2006, 2007. So, and he was hosting a lot of, uh, mixtapes back then. So he had a mixtape that he came out with, with, uh, it was a blog. I think it was Ill Roots and, uh, DJ Green Lantern. And he hosted and I did a, I did a project with him. I did a project with uh, Static Select, a couple people that I was on a mixtape with back then. But yeah, some dope shit. Nice. And before The Visionary came out, like, what was your music? Because, you know, that's the first thing that I was able to find of yours. What was your music like kind of before then? It was it was it was all over the place. There wasn't a lot of uh, stability. It was like we were we were like a, a frat house. You know what I mean? So we were recording a lot of music, but there wasn't any real direction. It was kind of like just us sparring or getting my skills right, getting up to the point. Because the the context, I'm a very true person, right? I can't really do anything to its full potential unless I know it's how I want to be represented. Mm -hmm. So 
it wasn't until later that I started finding that thread. Early on, it was me just trying a million different things. So that's why The Visionary was almost like a compilation of songs up to that point. Mm -hmm. You know, some of those songs on that were a lot earlier than that, like 17, 18 years old, even though the, the tape came out when I was 20, 21. Uh -huh. Some of those songs were from 17, 18 years old. So The Visionary is a lot of prior to Visionary. Yeah, I mean, the thing about The Visionary that's interesting is, you know, there's the songs about I'm the best rapper, and then there's mm -hmm. the stuff about kind of like trying to find your place as an, as an artist. I mm -hmm. don't think I'm a superstar. I think I'm this other kind of person. I'll never make a thriller and I'll never be a Jay-Z. I'm satisfied enough that you took the time to play me. I think I was born at the wrong time. I belong when Big J and Nas was all signed before there was And then there's the the stuff that was interesting to me, this kind of street stuff that you wouldn't do much of afterwards where you talk about like you know, I'm on the street, I'm dealing, I'm doing this, that, yeah. kind, of, that kind of stuff yeah. that would kind of disappear after that. The block hustler, rock smuggler, got customers, a shot juggler, pop one in a cop juggler. Cake stack it, that great rapper you take after the hate gathers who won't die. Hold up, hold up, slap. Bring that shit back. Yeah, you know, it was, that was me. There was a, there was, there was two ways to write. You can write from personal experience and mold the rhymes around what you want to say, or you can rhyme and mold what you want to say off of what rhymes. Mm -hmm. And I was a bar dude. And at that time, describing dealing drugs and describing killing somebody and describing the streets was the only vernacular that I had, you know, as far as bars and punchlines went. Mm -hmm. So it was like, if you, if, if I'm going to compare something to something using a simile or a metaphor, I'm going to base it around, I'm going to cloak it in street shit, mm -hmm. colloquialisms or whatever you want to call it. I'm going to dress it in basketball references, whatever I can to exercise my wordplay. Beyond that, it's sort of like acting. You know, we're obsessed as as MCs, especially a lot of street artists out here. They, yo, I'm real, man. Everything I say, I do. Well, not only is that impossible because everyone has hyperbole in their writing, right? So 50 Cent carrying a gun the size of Bow Wow. Well, Bow Wow is about 5'2", 150 pounds. We're talking about a, uh, a nuclear rocket launcher here. Everyone has hyperbole in rapping history, right? Yeah. But also, this is almost like vocal uh, acting. Because just like uh, Denzel Washington in Training Day, um, you, can, you can play a role that you've seen or experienced. Or any actor for that matter, you know? So it was like, I knew these stories. I knew how drug dealers were. I knew how addicts were. So it wasn't really anything for me to describe it from a real life point of view. Mm -hmm. And one, one moment on The Visionary that I wanted to talk about, you have Torre on a track. Yeah, Torre. And he pronounces your name wrong. Yeah. For the young veteran on the right path to some legend shit. Me and Cam Bad and Collab, the goon bad of attack. And spit bodies while we find the track. Why'd you why'd you let that slide? Um, I I've always been kind of, especially at that point, I was distant. You know what I mean? It was like that collab happened vicariously through my DJ, who at the time was doing everything. He was like managing for me and everything, and he was doing some work with Torre. We and that's how the collab kind of happened. Mm -hmm. So. He probably just saw the email, saw my name, just pronounced it whatever way he could and, and left it. And people were fucking my name up so much that I was just like, Shh. you know, I let it slide, man. You know, we'll laugh about it later. Yeah. yeah. And so the Visionary 2 comes out and that kind of the spiritual themes that mm. are sort of more full bloom on later records start mm. kind of sneaking in a little bit. Yeah. I'm not just a stereotypical rapper. I'm more like a rare individual rapper, lyrical master with the voice of a spiritual pastor, mind of a genius, a barbarian's physical stature. You call it crap. Where, where were you at? Where was your head as you were making that project? Um, I was working, man. At this point, I, I had a girlfriend. I was working a nine to five job, not knowing if rap was going to be the thing that I do. I mean, it, it was the only thing I had faith in because it's the only thing that I kind of sharpened throughout my life. I kind of put everything else to the side and only incubated that skill. So it was like, fuck, 
I'm not good at anything else really. Uh, you know, I'm a salesman, which is like the most stressful job in the world. I'm putting on all this weight. You well, know, what were you selling, by the way? What was the cell phones? So I was selling cell phones at Costco. Mm. You know, so there was there was times where I had time to write, and I was there was a point where I was living in a hotel, and I had to walk back and forth. It was like so it was so terrible, but I was able to write. I was able to write in my head. I was able to do all of this. So at the same time. I, I was I never let go of it, and this was me transitioning from working in from J, uh, J Nice. But at this point, I have money, so I didn't have him, but I had money to invest, and I I didn't have a you know weed habit or anything. I didn't have a liquor habit, nothing. So all of my money went into music, you know. So I was able to still keep shit up and keep shit going. I had DJ uh, Big Mike host that tape. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far as the real life shit, working nine to five, realizing that stress, man. I mean, I started getting alopecia. Now you're thinking shit is so hard. You're retrospectively coming down on yourself. It's like depression is setting in. So I started really getting a little deep. Plus, I'm getting older. You know, as as you live, you it's like a snowball effect, especially with wording, you know, verbiage. So it, it just gets, it expands. You know, that project, a couple of things happened for the first time on that project. Uh, it is the first time, at least that I've found, that you mention your brother uh, on Unstoppable Bullet. Yeah. Think of Sean Bell, think of Tupac Shakar, think of my brother J.R. dead on the lobby floor. Think of the millions upon millions and it's probably more. Just think it only takes one of these to start a war. And you don't certainly don't have to talk about it, but what happened with him? Yeah, this is a this is a I considered him a brother. It was my sister. Me and my sister have different fathers, mm -hmm. but her sister was there. I mean, her father was there much longer. She came into my life when I was five. She was born when I was five, but she was living with me the whole time. Her dad had a son already that was always around. So I considered him a brother. His name was Jr. Um, he was actually shot and killed. Uh, in uh, New Haven. So, you know, I, it could have been a drug deal, something to do with, you know, girls, women, but it, it hit the family real hard at the time. And it was like, you know, fuck, like, it was like my first time experiencing someone close to me getting shot and killed like that, you know, so it was, how, how it was really... How old were you when that happened? Do you remember? Uh, I was about 19, 20, 20 years old, around there, mm -hmm. something like that. Wow. Yeah. Um, another, another thing that, well, it's, it's funny you mentioned your state of mind at the time and with regards to like your job and stuff because you have green light on that record, which is all about sort of a complicated relationship with money. Yeah. I don't worship you, but then again I do. They call you devil's pie. I call you angel fool. You bring me pretty women. You bring me fancy cars. You put me up in VIP so I can dance with stars. That's why I love you. See, I would kill for you. I'll do a bid for you. Neglect my own kid for you. Yeah, exactly. You hate it because you have to sacrifice your life to get it, but you love it because it's the only thing that gives you access to the things in life you'd want. Yeah. You know, and it was a concept song. So at one point, I think I'm speaking from the point of view of it. And the other time, I don't, I don't forget where the concept was as far as the perspective. But, yeah, it was like a dope concept. I remember that. Yeah. That's the first time that we hear Nino Bless on a project of yours. Yeah. Remember them days where a 20 year haze was like point nine in the scale and crime will prevail. Remember the cipher was ill, rhyming with skills, kicking our best lines. We ain't think of signing a deal. How did you hook up with him? Um, it's a crazy story, man. Uh, in, in, in Tampa, at this point, I'm, we're kind of making a name for ourselves. And uh, Eddie Deuce told me about they were in the mall, in the middle of a mall. There was a studio that got set up. It was called Remix Studio, and it's a great idea. I mean, the front part of it was all production shit, so you can make uh, beats. And then the back part was this big room with, you know, two booth boxes and these two studio setups. And I was going in there. They were, like, kind of trying to sponsor me at the time. And when I go in there, I meet, the, meet a rapper named Hunt. And he here, I was spitting on a track with Ransom at the time. You know what I mean? That I got through some other artist who had Ransom on the track. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hunt was in there and he's like, bro, you got crazy bars. Have you heard of my cousin Nino Bless? And at the time I saw, this is my space time. I remember going by his site and seeing that he had a song with Joe Budden and a whole uh, Crooked Eye or something like that. So I was aware of him. So I was like, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and then later on, we end up on the phone 
and you know Nino hears my music he hear he he hears what's going on and later we just hook up for a uh that verse we started doing other work outside of music um and the, the relationship just built built from there so that was that was around like 2010 maybe mm-hmm. you know so 2010 is when I when I first started talking to him, but then it kind of built up from there. Nice. There was a bit of a, a hiatus, at least in terms of music you released between 2010, the, the Visionary Two, and then the first Smoke and Mirrors project, The Porch, which yeah. was 2013. What was going on during that period? Um, transitioning from working to you know the management situation I had at the time. Uh, figuring shit out man it was like damn like music was changing so much around me getting out of like my whole mindset was getting the fuck out of this job like i I can never work again this is killing me no offense to people that work man you you, those are the strongest people in the world we wouldn't have anything around us if it wasn't for them but for me it was just it was basically suicide um i needed to get out of the job I needed to be, and I start bouncing her because I'm so broke. I can only last without money for like a month, maybe. I have to go to this call center, this call center. I'm over here. I'm over there. I'm here, wherever. So it was a lot of moving around, um, a lot of still trying to figure myself out musically and in life. Um, and then I moved out to Dunedin, which is a small beach town mm-hmm. in Florida. Uh, uh, right next to the water, sunny, a beautiful house. You know, I was, uh, this is with my girlfriend. And um, that's when everything changed because I started smoking weed. As soon as I got out there, I started. Uh, and I, I, There was a couple times prior to that that I was dealing with it, but I never could inhale it. Like the smoke was way too toxic for me and I would start coughing. It would just be ridiculous. It was almost like a joke with us. I would try, though. But it wasn't until I got out there that I committed to it. And I was like, fuck this, man. I got to get back rapping. I hear this is the magic medicine for rappers. Start smoking and realize what was I, what have I been missing this whole time? I used to have to trick myself to get into a meditative zone to write, mm-hmm. you know, because the focus wasn't there, you know, what I mean, ever until I was able to smoke and I wasn't able to smoke inside the house. So that was when the birth of the porch happened mm-hmm. from me smoking out there so much. Interesting. And, you know, one of the tracks on that record, uh, Sounds of the Cosmos. Yeah. You sort of set yourself up as someone who almost is unable to experience things because you're too busy and too caught up in thinking about them. I was coaching in the Petri dish. I can't live because I'm too focused on why we exist. I, don't... I was hoping you talk a little bit about that, that dichotomy of like trying to find a balance between either taking the time necessary to think about stuff, but also being able to step outside of that and actually live your life. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the, that's the dichotomy. And that's the, who I am as a person. Like I was saying earlier, as soon as I'm in the circle and I realize I'm in the circle, I now have to be out the circle so I can observe it, Mm -hmm. which creates an out circle because people start to observe like me and I have to be outside that. That whole that whole overthinking thing and 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 trying to calculate every single thing is that you know what I mean it kind of knocks you out your zone, but um sometimes you just have to be able to experience freely like a ignorant child would you know they say ignorance is bliss, and sometimes that knowledge and intellect can get in the way of that the mind gets in the way of the spirit sometimes, so you know. Just laying back on the beach or being able to run and just see the trees and the sun without trying to calculate what they mean and why they're there. You know, if when I trip balls, like it's it's a crazy experience because the way that I, I, I molded my mind, you know, so it's overthinking is what it is. I'm like, yeah, I'll be having fun laughing. And all of a sudden you'll see me like. Oh shit, like what are humans like? Oh, we're laughing right now, but we're on this strange planet. We have these weird tentacles at the end of our arms. What the fuck is going on? You know what I mean? So that's kind of where that comes from. Crazy. Obviously, you're in the South while you're making this record. Mm-hmm. And one very Southern moment on that record uh, is Harry the Tubman, where you use this kind of Memphis style triplet flow yeah the yeah whole song only some of us live and all of us die none of us laugh as much as we cry all of that beauty and nothing inside all of that money and none of your pride none of you fight you run and you hide but only the strong are gonna survive the country is under corruption it's running on nothing but money we trust in their lives they puff it alive what what inspired that 
it was really the beat. You know, I came across the beat. Shout out to D Man. He he it came off an instrumental CD he had. I was a big fan of his over, over online. I never met him in real life, but um, it was the beat. And then hearing, I, I when I hear the beat, I usually hear a color or see a color. I usually get a feeling from it, an emotion. And when I heard that beat, I just went back and I saw the rough times of, you know, black people through history, what we're going through now in this modern slavery with all people, um, with this money and chasing materialism and consumerism, it's a modern day slavery. So that's where that comparison came from, the beat, the tone, the color. I was seeing like almost like a warm yellow uh which reminded me of like fields and like shit like that. So that's where the whole slave thing came from. But, um, yeah, that, that is, it's the flow came from the time signature and the beat basically. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And one of the things about your style that I, I wanted to get into was, you know, I'll, I'll ask a lot of rappers about similes, right. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, Oh, you know, I have, you know, I love hearing Lord finesse use similes and, yeah. and, and things seem to kind of flow from that. The way you use similes in particular, it always seems like there has to be another level to them, right? There has to be like a pun or a double meaning or something. Yeah. It's not just like, I, my flow is wet like water or whatever. Yeah, like yeah. there's always kind of an additional twist to yeah. how you construct those things. I'm the bottom man, yeah. human contraband, cause I'm ill eagle like a bird in a doctor's hand. I was hoping you'd talk about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it's like uh, you got to add that intellectual uh, intellectual depth to kind of uh, add a different level of difficulty. It's not enough to just dunk from the free throw line. I got to dunk from the free throw line, put it through my legs, and then at the end of it, I got to do a shimmy. Right. You know what I mean? It's 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 a it's to um, sh you know show my prowess as an in intellect, but it's also it's effective uh, time usage, too, because if I could layer something in a sandwich, wh why give you eggs, bacon, pancakes, and sausage when I can make a McGriddle? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? I can, so I can tell you so much more and so much less. That's the real tool of lyricism. You know, uh, if I could layer one or two lines with the same amount of stuff that you get out of four or five, then I'm, I'm a very effective writer. Yeah. And you also have this thing that you do really well, of like keeping an image going through or an mm -hmm. idea going through like a bunch of lines and kind of twisting and turning, but always kind of returning to this one theme. Yeah. Um, can you talk about that kind of keeping some, you know, an idea consistent through like a long stretch of, of writing. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's that same thing. Like keeping the thread going is that is it. It's like, you know, walking on a tight rope while juggling, while balancing a pie on your head, keeping, keeping the movement going, always coming back. Like if you're dancing with a partner and no matter what you do outside that partner, spin, tap your leg, you always come back to the partner. And that's what it is. Like I have to stay in the melody pocket. I have to respond to the melody. And I also have to either keep the rhyme scheme intact. So sometimes it might not be the content that stays intact or the context, but it may just be the rhyme sequence. You know, I might be rhyming like five or six syllables in a row for the entire song. So it's either going to happen in the storyline or it's going to happen in the technical aspect of the rhyme scheme. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it's interesting you say that because, you know, too loud. Mm -hmm. When I heard it for the first time, I was like, wow, that's like, that's a different thing for him. It sounds yeah. kind of like a simple trap song or whatever. Yeah. But then I noticed when I sat down to listen to it again, I noticed you do that for the whole first verse. You rhyme yeah. everything with the title. Too loud. Too loud. It's man. And you know my whole crew wild. I set up the trap. Like I'm home alone inside a new house. I know I promised you a day ago, but it's due now. You don't pay me, I'm a play still. You stop. Yeah, yeah, too loud, including the hook. So, yeah, that's that's so the thinkers have something to play with. You know what I mean? It's like uh, South Park does that on a level. Uh, Family Guy does it too. They have the point of this. The, they have the cartoon, which is obviously. You know, a baby can watch a fucking see little bangs crawling around. But um, 
they'll have a metaphor and then they'll have a metaphor and they'll have a metaphor under it. And depending on how deep you are, you're going to get them all. And that's, that's kind of what that is on too loud. Like I know that half my fan base may hate this song, you know, but not only does it reflect the times, which sometimes as an artist, you have to pay respect to, you always want to be so unique and original, but sometimes it, it, there's nothing wrong with dancing with the crowd. Right. As far as that goes, but it's me bringing my spin on it. I, I enjoy that kind of music in my personal life. I listen to it all the time. And if you listen to songs like Bada the Sinner or Stupid or So Cocky. I'm a bad influence to the average student because they'd rather have a as a cattle unit than absorbing data from this rapping music. When the battle grew and Mac is popping through it, this is trapping music. This is crack, I'm moving. See my mama struggle, see my daddy lose it. It's a bad illusion. So much. I'm the epitome of a dawn. Put my money on the seesaw in the lip of elephant. 2050 is my girlfriend's measurements. Voted 10 times when we elected the president because I am 10 times the man that you have ever been. A lot of my original songs, I always have at least one or two songs that can be considered ignorant and swaggish. Mm -hmm. So this was my spin on it. And when I heard the beat, uh, shout out to Ace Sinclair uh, Focus Group. They uh, The beat was so trappy. It's so dark. I, I love smoking. I love all the all the thrills of everyone. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, Buddha should have been able to fuck too, you know, and smoke <laughs> a blunt. You know what I mean? Like, why not? You're missing out, bro. <laughs> um speaking of buddha that kind of makes me want to jump back to the the middle smoke and mirrors project for a second the womb mm. um because i'm there the kind of like mystic stuff ratchets up pretty significantly yeah like right from the beginning literally from the intro you're talking about like reincarnation and mm -hmm. pineal gland stuff like that Smoke. some say your spirit or your light transmits into your brain's pineal gland in the 13th week of gestation yeah 13 being the highest of the sufferer, the beginning and the end of the cycle. This is not your first time here. What happened in the lead into that record to make that element of stuff kind of increase so much? Yeah, that started increasing as the level of psychedelics started increasing. Makes and sense. then <laughs> the pursuit of knowledge, I started immediately going to the top. I was like, who are the greatest philosophers that have to do specifically with consciousness, reality? Um, what does it mean to the point of life type shit? Like, why are we on this spherical planet? If it is spherical, is it a plane? Is it a computer game? So uh, on this conquest, I ran into Alan Watts, mm -hmm. all his shit aired it out. Terrence McKenna, all his shit, Phil Valentine, Bobby Hemet, uh, uh, Jidu Krishnamurti, uh, all the greatest philosophers I could find shit on, I watched. I watched every documentary. I read every book, whether it be physical or audio book, uh, by Robert Greene. I did, uh, The Alchemist. The writers at Camp Auto Mentions all deal with issues of consciousness and the nature of the mind. They range from more esoteric philosophies about Satan or ancient Kemet to Robert Greene's hard nosed analyses of power. You can hear our interview with Green, a favorite author amongst rappers because of his popular book, The 48 Laws of Power, on episode 61. I did all the religious doctrines, Tao uh, Te Ching, um, a lot of the sutras, anything that I could find I was getting because I was starting to realize that all this shit is the same, all of it's interlocking, all of it's mathematic and patterns. So that was where the wound came from. It was it was the transition process from the porch to the crack baby. Um, and it, it kind of get people ready for that mindset, you know? One thing on, on the womb, on the title track, mm -hmm. you mentioned rapping and you talk about it as, as the act of rapping as being like having the best qualities of both speech and of singing. Mm -hmm. What if singing is the language of the soul? What if speaking is the language of the mind? What if rap is really both of those combined? And this is the Bible if it rhymes. You would think that Wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, speaking conversationally is almost strictly mental. It feels that way. It feels more... It feels more... Uh, linear and processed music has more curvature it has more it's more malleable it's more flowing this is almost spiritual like a fluid like water it's like water versus matter 
So the blending of the two, rap is a phenomenon because it is the most verbal, intellectual form of music that modern humans have ever experienced. Um, and then, but at the same time, it's musical. It's within rhythm. It has this. So it is the most effective tool. Mm -hmm. But it's a blending. It's almost like a bisexuality of the 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 extreme polarity of hot and the extreme polarity of cold. You know. Interesting. And so the following record, the the Crack Baby one, mm -hmm. you have the song The Shaman. Yeah. And in it, you talk about the biological idea of evolution mm -hmm. and sort of compare that to technological evolution, right? Yep. The, I think you use the example of video game systems, right? Mm -hmm. Video game systems started off as Atari and, you know, over time got more and more sophisticated and now look at where they are and you yeah. kind of compare that to the the biological process of evolution. What if we evolve like game graphics? Imagine pixels exploding with Big Bang happened. Early man was Atari, we currently PS3. So we evolve in the same patterns. Uh, How did you sort of start thinking about those connections? Man, it's a deep process, man. Like I said, a lot of it ha happens to do with uh, me just observing nature and the internal ground. These are all things I think I would have came up to regardless of whether I studied or not. Because you realize that the things that make us up, the subatomic particles, atoms, whatever they may be, visually just appear like until I touch you, until I touch you, you're no different than a uh, two dimensional picture on the screen. So the visual aspect, whether it's atoms, molecules or whatever, these are like photons. These are like pixels, really, really defined high definition pixels. So when you hear things about uh, Big Bang or the process of the creation of humans, it sounds a lot like going from 8-bit visuals to 1080p. Because with games, with video games, if I'm not wrong, it's a process, it's, it, it's a buildup of the coding. So maybe GTA uh, 1 has this much coding. Then the programmers add more and more and more depth over time. This sounds like exactly what's happening with human beings at this present time. You start off with a Ford Model T, and as more humans are born and the, these ideas become manifested, you end up with a you know electric car that you know has Wi-Fi and MP3s in it. And you see, everything we do is a reflection of ourselves, right? We can't get out of it. Every time we create an a alien, it always has humanoid features. Every time we create a computer, it's always in reflection to the brain. Every time we make a camera, it's a reflection of uh, the eye lens, the curvature in the eye lens. Everything that we do is, in effect, the process of creating God in our own reflection. That's as clear as day. So that's kind of where that came from, you know, the the, the comparison. And so your your new project DMT mm -hmm. is kind of a best of of the yeah. three previous mixtapes with you know five or six new songs. What made you decide to say, okay, I'm putting a cap on the the smoke and mirrors idea? Uh, it was it was a combination of things, both uh, technical and artistically. Uh, from a technical aspect of it. Uh, some of the copyright issues with some of the production, you know, kind of made it so I had to take some of the songs off both tapes in order for them to be on digital distribution. So it was like, all right, I want to keep these projects. Can I ask if these were sampling issues or? It was, yeah, copyright sampling production issues, you know, de dealing with different producers, getting rights for the beats, various things. So instead of just chopping up the tapes and leaving them incomplete online, take them down, still have them available on my website and SoundCloud, take the songs that I have rights to and then repost those with some new songs in order to kind of, but at the same time, it's like, at, at the same time I'm thinking of this, I'm like, this is a great opportunity for me to condense material. Um, and also, like you said, kind of put a capstone on it, you know, uh, allow for new people to hear new songs, old people hear new songs, you know, it's, it's kind of a blending of the two. It was a great idea to DMT. It just made sense. You know? Yeah. The title track on that, you use pretty much all of the, almost the entirety of the lyrics are made up of using, you know, words that start with D and then M and then T mm -hmm. in sequence. DMT is a deep majority test. 
Designed by Dakotas of the Morris text. I dance so majestic in the twilight. I'm DMT laced, drinking my ties. Is something like that tough to do? Like, how tough was that to do and still have it make sense? Um, honestly, because of the rules at hand, it was easier to do than a song that doesn't have such an obvious thread. Mm -hmm. So the process of creation is actually easy. What takes a long time is going through all the D words, going through all the M words, going through all the T words, still making sure it rhymes and still make sure it has to do with DMT. Like I'm not going to say drive motor trucks unless the next line can be something that has to like a metaphor to flip that to have to do with DMT or the esoteric world. So it's like, that's the difficult factor is staying in bounds, staying, you know, true to the rhyme scheme. I mean, it, it, it sounds more difficult than it was to do for me, but it's because the way that my, I program my brain to write rhymes, it just works, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, rapping wise, this comes out, I think, especially on, you know, when gods use guns and stuff like that, like some of the, the layers and double meanings and things that you do. You know, as I was uh, talking actually on Twitter the other day about your your line about you know I want a Bugatti like Mickey Ward's fans. You know, the sort of double meanings and things like that. Are those things that you just sort of trained yourself to kind of see everywhere? Now? Everywhere, everywhere. I read every word, uh, right to left, bef first. I'm always splitting up every word. I'm always trying to find every word I hear. I try to find a way to flip it, you know? So it's like, it's, if, if I'm rhyming race car, you know, I'll get to maybe great star or, you know, I, you know, I hate bars. Eventually I'm going to fall into a word that I, I can say, hold up, hold up. What else has to do with that? You know what I mean? And then from there, so like, I want a Bugatti like Mickey Ward fans. You know, after hearing the word Bugatti so many times, I'm like, Bugatti, Bugatti, Bugatti. So Gotti, there's John Gotti, and then there's Arturo Gotti. They're not going to boo John Gotti. They're going to boo Arturo Gotti. But who's going to boo Arturo Gotti? He fought a lot of people. Well, who are his most famous fights? Okay, Mickey Ward. Mickey Ward's not going to boo him because he's fighting him. It's his fans. And it just comes out like that. That's just how I'm going to split up every single word that I ever see. I'm going to find a way to come out with it. And I got some stuff coming up, too, that it's... It takes that to the whole next world. Nice. I, yeah. I can't wait to hear it. Anything yeah. you're anything you're willing to share? Um, I don't. I, it's yeah, not complete enough, man. It's like trying to give birth to a four month old. <laughs> four month old. I mean, as far as the process in right. the womb, right? You know, right. like a feel un incomplete fetus is going to come out. Skin's going to be clear and gelatin. Gotcha. And I was curious, just because I'm such a huge fan of his, about your feelings about Jay Z, because you don't mention a ton of rappers in your song. Yeah. But he's one, you know, from your very earliest stuff, he's kind of like a touchstone as like the superstar. But you have it, you re you've wrapped over a couple of his Reasonable Doubt era beats. you know why is he a big sort of comparison point touchstone for you yeah not i mean his his albums his specifically reasonable doubt is one of my top three albums of all time he's notably popularly like the Michael Jordan of, of hip hop. I mean, his comparison, career. he's not shy about making himself. The Mike Jordan, the rap, Mike Jackson, the cop. Worry, I'm not the Mike Jordan or the Mike McCord. And with the third pick, I made the earth sick. MJ, MJ, fade away, perfect. Go, Michael, take the pick. Jackson, Tyson, Jordan, 
game six. It's not even close, just leave it alone. I'm Mike Joy and I play for the team I own. Sing- yeah, and he, he kind of said it. He put it out there. He was, yeah. like, really the first to say, I'm the GOAT. I'm the greatest of all time. And he, because of that, he is. Like, financially, the moves he's make. I mean, geez, it, it will never probably happen like that again. So not only do I I honor that, but if you're the king and I'm a young lion, I also have to look at you as somebody that, if need be, I'm going to have to be prepared to battle. Not maybe literally because he's in a completely different tax bracket, but musically to get to the level of reasonable doubt or blueprint is has to be the goal because he set the bar that high. Mm-hmm. So... I do. I have to. I have to keep that in mind. Like when I'm going on that court, and Kobe Bryant's on the other side of that court, or Stephen Curry's on the other side of that court, it's nice to see my idols. But I have to be prepared to drain a couple threes in his face or dunk on him. And when I dunk on him, it's going to be harder than when I dunk on anyone else. With all due respect. Sure. And just one or two more things. You know, I was listening yesterday to the freestyle you did over Shaba Ranks. And mm. there is there is a crazy line in there yeah. about the the Pox Quad Studio shooting. Hope you got a chin like Rocky, Salvador Dali, Matador, but I'm more cocky. Do you like big dip pock in the lobby? Hot like wasabi. I put my cock in Punani. Then I, be- I think it was it was done sort of playfully into shock, but yeah. it still sounds shocking even, you know, how many twenty years after the, the yeah. quad studio shooting it was just, talk about like writing that well yeah it was like everyone that i know especially the way that they made it look in a notorious movie and anywhere you hear like yo biggie had nothing to do with that yo it wasn't biggie yo it wasn't big well as a com- as a thinker as a creator as a you know i like to have comedic lines in there it's our job to say hold up but what if he did <laughs> you know what i mean and i'm just gonna put it out there like yo yeah he did it boom it's gonna force people to talk about it and you know blah blah, blah. like music is the only thing like if i sit here and talk to you you have the ability to say wait hold on i don't believe that mm-hmm. you know this that and the other for whatever reason when people listen to you rap they're completely receptive to it and they believe what you say it's not like conversation Part of that is because of the vicarious experience. You believe what I say because you want to believe that you would say the same thing. And because you can put your headphones on, hear me and not see me, you then become me. That's the only reason. So when I say these ultra crazy cocky things, my listeners are going to hear it as if they're saying it and it's going to give them the power. So, you know. Yeah. And finally, just, you know, now that you have the... DMT compilation, Smoke and Mirrors is kind of is done. What's what's next? Um, I'm working on I'm I'm trying to work on the greatest project of my life. I I wanna work on my first album. Like all of these I consider mixtapes. As far as how they were created and the difference in what I'm trying to do with this. These albums they came the 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 previous one, Smoke and Mirrors, Visionary, came off like albums because of the seriousness and that I took with the sound and the and the production. But really, um it, it wasn't. The process was kind of all over the place. There wasn't um I engineered and produced I mean, I engineered and mixed most of it myself in a room. You know, so it was like I uh, want, that that six months of college paid off. Yeah, right. <laughs> but um this next project will take everything that I've done to the next level, songwriting to the next level, lyricism, har- um, harmony, vocal tone, concepts, continuity from front to back. Um, it, it's, it will be the album that it'll, it'll, I'm going to design it to be the last album I ever have to make. You know, of course, I'm planning on making more. But if I die after this, I'm OK. That's that's the only emotion I have. Creatively, it's always ones and zeros. It's always black and white. Can I die today is the only thing I can say after I create something. Is this good enough that if I die today, I can live forever? You know, and that's the mindset in this next project. I have like. More songs written for this than I've written for any other project. So I know when it comes down to it, I'm going to be able to die after this project. Wow. You know? Is there any working titles for it or anything? Um, Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. I have a couple in mind, but they're so 
like I said, I can't let it out my head until uh, it's completely incubated. But I have some stuff that's going to be real impactful. It's going to be impactful. It's going to be the kind of project that people are going to want to talk about and either hate me or love me type dude. It's got to be that, you know, the more de- the more I don't want to say desperation, the more urgency that comes in with you with, you know, financially. I, I want to be a millionaire. I want to be one of the greats. And the longer it takes, the more you have to do. I'm going to have to go in the ring as a, you know, 28 year old boxer and knock everyone out through the ropes in order to get to that belt. Yeah. You know, that's how it's got to work. Well, that sounds like a great note to end on. Mm-hmm. Cambada, thank you so much. Yes, Cambada. Thank you, Sean, man. Cypher show. Great. Yo, uh, visit www.cambadamusic.com for all merchandise and music at Cambada Music on Twitter and Instagram. Follow me, and dope shit will happen. One of the main things that makes this episode stand out to me is really how deep we get into the craft of rhyming. You can tell Cambada's passion for words and their hidden meanings. Uh, That's also something I got a dose of after the interview, when he provided a several-minute breakdown of the hidden messages on a can of Red Bull. Even more than all that, though, it's Cambada's growth as an artist, chemically enhanced though it may have been, that is most fascinating to me. His growth from the talented but more conventional mixtape artist into someone with a unique vision is something that I'm glad we are able to capture. Don't forget to send your answers to the questions at the beginning of the show to contest at thecyphershow.com to enter to win our special Cambada prize, a t-shirt and a USB business card with a copy of his brand new album, DMT. Join us next week when our guest will be Allah B, one of the key players in the nation of gods and earths, sometimes called the 5% nation of Islam. If you've ever listened to Wu-Tang, Rakim, Big Daddy Kane, or Brand Nubian, ever used slang like word and peace, or ever stood in a b-boy stance, you felt the influence of the gods and earths, whether you've known it or not. Allah B was there from the beginning. He had a close relationship with the founder of the Five Percenters, Clarence Smith, who came to be known as Allah, or the Father. We take a fascinating trip with Allah B, from meeting the father while running from the cops as a teenager, all the way to watching his nation take over the world through a new culture called hip-hop. And we'll meet Malcolm X, Russell Simmons, and many more along the way. Plus, you'll get the best explanation of why we're called the Cypher from a direct disciple of the inventor of the supreme mathematics from which the show takes its name. You won't want to miss this. Like I said at the beginning, make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing to the Cypher on your podcast app of choice. If that app is iTunes, it's hugely important to give us a rating or a review. And don't forget to visit patreon.com slash the cypher show if you enjoy the program and help us out with even a dollar a month. If you want to talk to me or Josh about the show, visit us on social media. We're at the cypher show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr. Let us know what you thought of this episode and who you'd like to see in the future. Better yet, tweet directly at the artist and let them know you'd like them to appear on the show. More information about anything related to the podcast, playlists, our complete archives, and more can be found for free at thecyphershow.com. The Cypher is created and written by Sean Sotaro. That's when everything changed because I started smoking weed. The show is produced and engineered by Josh Cross at Crosstown Studios. You believe what I say because you want to believe that you would say the same thing. Our music is by 42 Ghosts. It is the most verbal, intellectual form of music that modern humans have ever experienced. Our web guru is Aaron Young. When I trip balls, like, it's it's a crazy experience. And our intern is Aziza Hassan. I think the deeper the ritual and the regimen, the deeper you convince yourself. That's where magic comes from. Special thanks to our top Patreon supporter, Vikram. And I was a bar dude. We'll see you next time around on The Cypher.
<laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I say some zany shit, man. I feel like if I wasn't born in this era, I would I would be. The process of writing comedy is very similar to writing uh, raps. It's like the punchline, the creative wordplay. Mm -hmm. That's where I would be for sure.